we double down on commissioners for ag, I say candidates for ag commissioner, Roy Ramey. Roy ran four years ago, uh, retired lieutenant colonel from the U.S. Army, 33 years of service, and uh, picked up 38% of the vote in the last uh, uh, time he challenged the current ag commissioner. Roy, good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me on the show. What brings you to the Eastern Panhandle today? People. <laughs> a lot of them. About 200,000 of them. <laughs> there are a lot. Yeah, I came over to uh, to see some voters again. Uh, as you as you mentioned, I'm running for Commissioner of Agriculture, and and uh, this is about as far away in the state as, as I am on the <laughs> other side of the state, and uh, I just wanted to take another opportunity to get over here and see some of the folks before the election. Roy, tell us why you're running once again. Well, the... Uh, you know, I'm a small farmer in Cabell County, and I think we got way too many regulations, which are causing a lot of farms a lot of problems. Uh, the, we've lost uh, 1,122 farms during the current administration and 162,000 acres of farmland. And there's a few reasons uh, that all fit into there, but one of the overwhelming reasons is too many regulations and too oppressive of regulations. And I don't stand for that. And my position is to try to cut uh, the regulations and get government out of our business as much as possible and let these farms seek prosperity. Roy, how did you figure out a limited budget? You did uh, 38 percent of the vote in your last election uh, attempt here. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I did that uh, in part with social media and I had a few radio ads, but really it was making a connection directly with people. Uh, people want to be heard. And the, uh, the current administration just doesn't listen to people. I get around to talk to real farmers uh, who are still trying to do this. I've talked to farmers who used to be farmers, and they've closed their doors uh, to the operation. And, uh, and they just want to be heard. And I feel like uh, I can make a good connection with these people and, and hear what they have to say and understand their plight. And, uh, and then transition that into what can we do to fix the problem. And you, I think that's how I relate to the people. What do you identify as the main problems in the state? Uh, big regulations. Uh, there, so there's an access to land uh, is a part of it. Uh, you know, that's not so much just the regulation part, but uh, uh, the regulations are coming from both the federal and the state side. And, uh, uh, for example, uh, until recently we had a prohibition against selling raw milk. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've certainly fixed that problem now. It's in the process of being fixed. We have a problem with meat processors uh, and the heavy regulations on that industry. And uh, there's one of the largest uh, state inspected meat plants over in my part of the state. And uh, he's having to lay off workers because there's not enough cattle coming through for them to process. Uh, and they sell locally in the community uh, and allow farmers to sell local in the community. So when you have that kind of a thing, uh, everything keeps getting smaller. Uh, we're losing opportunities, and that's just the wrong way to go, in my opinion. I believe it was uh, the man you passed out front to help get that raw milk legislation it was. passed. Right? <laughs> yeah, Hornby. Delegate Hornby was the lead sponsor of that bill, uh, and he was uh, absolute uh, on fire and a ramrod to make that happen, and I'm very pleased with uh, the way that bill went. And we've worked on it for 12 years now under three different commissioners of agriculture who have tried to stop it. And uh, some delegates in the past and, and senators were supportive, but not enough. And uh, with Delegate Hornby leading that charge in the, the House, uh, I mean, I'm just ecstatic that we were able to get that passed. Why was that uh, so important to you, Roy? And why do you think that's such a key thing for the small farmer or even bigger farmers to have as a possibility now? Yes, sir. So it's important because it's a symbol of freedom. Uh, it's a freedom to be able to produce a product that people want in the community. It's not going into the industrial system. It's not like a small farmer is going to produce uh, raw milk and send it across the country. It's a very local thing, and that helps promote local economy and freedom amongst uh, the consumers to be able to get a product that there is a demand for. And I didn't think there was a huge demand for it. You know, I don't have any illusion of that. It's just a matter of if we can cut the... Uh, the onerous regulations on that. There's a bureaucracy behind it, and there's an industrial system behind stopping raw milk because it doesn't have to go through a factory. You cut out all the middlemen, and the farmer can actually make all of the money. If you sell a gallon of milk for $6, you, as the farmer, you get the entire $6 minus your direct expenses. In the industrial system, they get less than a dollar per gallon of milk uh, in totality, and all the middlemen get their little pieces so the farmer is, is out. And so the reason this was so important is because it inspires 
uh, local farmers to have an opportunity to sell in their community, and it builds the economy in that community directly. Matt, I do like the hat. Thank you, sir. Make milk raw again. What What was the biggest issue that that, that you had in that twelve year fight to to be able to to get across the finish line? Is it just a matter of of those that maybe didn't understand and were thinking of safety and that sort of thing? Yes, that's correct. So there's a, there's a big narrative out there that raw milk is dangerous, and uh, they use the CDC and the FDA and the USDA and all these government agencies in order to spread that narrative, and it's it's not totally wrong. If you mishandle the product, uh, you could introduce, uh, you know, harmful bacteria. But there are safe handling practices that if we just teach our farmers, like any other food, you know, you don't take your, your food at home and go stick it out in a mud puddle and then bring it in and put it on your family's plate. So, you know, it's a matter of let's – let's handle this correctly and so there's safe handling practices weston a price is an organization who uh, puts out a list of what these safe handling practices are and they teach workshops uh, where you can learn that and they're basic common sense things you know you you clean the udder uh, you make sure there's no infection um, uh, you get it uh, refrigerated uh, at a certain temperature right we educate our consumers that they've got to handle it you know there's a responsibility on their end uh, you don't just put it in the back seat for an hour drive home. Uh, you don't uh, take it out of the refrigerator at dinner time and set it on the table for an hour and then put it back afterward. You know, so there's mm -hmm. there's some safe handling practices that are common sense, and it's just a matter of teaching people that. In, in, and, in the old days uh, when people had a milk box, an insulated milk box on their front porch, and the, the guy in the truck drove by, and, and put the, the, it wasn't a full gallon bottle, it was maybe like, a, I don't know, Typically a quart, quartz. quart bottle. Was that basically raw milk that the local it farmers was. were dropping off at people's houses? It absolutely was. And you pretty was. much finished it in one day, and then the and next that day. And was, that was an inherently local system. Yeah. You know, nobody was shipping that across the country. Again, it was somebody in the community that had a few cows, and they were milking them. And then uh, they had a distribution either directly by the farmer or you had a milkman that right. that was their job and responsibility, just like the mailman brings you the mail every day. Uh, the milkman would bring the milk every day. And, uh, you I'm know, they old, might I'm old enough to remember few. that that insulated uh, box of, on the front porch. I remember having one of those I, as a little kid. I still have one yeah. <laughs> that we grew up with, and I've kept it along uh, for myself, so. Do you have milk cows on your small farm there in Cabell uh, County? So now? dairy is not anything that I do, or okay. and it's not anything that I want to do. But what I do want to do is, as a as a farmer, I want to produce the products that I produce and mm -hmm. sell to my community. And I want to be able to buy a gallon of milk from a neighbor who wants to produce it. Yeah. And we don't want to have to look over our shoulder, is the food police coming to take us to jail? Uh, because, you know, in the legacy world, uh, milk has been as illegal as moonshine. So... And I think that was inherently wrong. How did you get into farming yourself? Well, I grew up farming, okay. uh, and uh, and we did hogs and some chickens and corn, right. and I didn't like it. It was hard work. Uh, I didn't appreciate the value of it. And I went off to college to go be, you know, what smart kids do and, and uh, big jobs and whatever. And then after I got out of college, I thought, you know, that wasn't such a bad life. Uh, I liked it, uh, but I was engaged in the military at the time and other uh, activities, so it took me uh, almost 20 years to find and buy my own farm. And uh, me and my wife, a uh, few years after we got married, kept looking. And we finally found the place that we're on now. And uh, that's been uh, 16 years ago. And uh, we just want to produce food for our local community, first for ourselves. And then since we were spending the money and the time and all the input, uh, we might as well produce extra for our community. And that's how we grew into actually being a, a, a farmer for our community and making production sales. Is that what kind of led you to say, I want to run to be the ag commissioner as you, you know, were moving along and progressing and growing and seeing what was going on in farming? Is that what led you to say, we need some changes? Uh, so it was a long time after that before I decided that, you know, because I don't want to be this guy. I just want somebody to stay out of our business and we had uh, previous commissioners that uh, uh, I never even necessarily knew about because they didn't get in our business that much. And I, I put the farm on pause uh, uh, around 2015 uh, to go on an active duty tour with the Army Reserve. And uh, when I came back after a three-year tour, 
I uh, went to gear things back up, and we had a new commissioner, and they were pushing some of these onerous regulations that I rail against. And I thought, man, this is just not sustainable. So that got me into uh, into deciding I needed to be the guy. And after working on the raw milk bill in particular, I saw this one person is standing in the way about the time that you get uh, – uh, you get a bill into a delegate, you know, who who says, yep, I'll lead the charge on this. And you get a few others on board as a co-sponsor. And then uh, you're starting to build the momentum in the legislature. Then either the commissioner or one of his people come around and put their, uh, put their arm around their shoulder and say, you need to kill this bill because we don't like raw milk. And, and then mysteriously it just dies in committee. And that's how that process works. Uh, I've been involved in homeschool legislation and some other stuff, and I've seen that again and again through that whole process. And so I thought the one person that's standing in the way is this commissioner. They change the uh, the scope of uh, the priorities of the department, and my priority is to let's cut the regulations, let's get them out of our business instead of being more onerous and trying to develop a, a kingdom for bureaucracy. I don't want a kingdom for bureaucracy. I want farmers to go out and be the – the entrepreneurs that they should be and uh, local economy being able to thrive. And right now it all stops from the bureaucracy. So so you may have just answered my next question. Uh, I was going to ask, how do you then in your position as the ag commissioner deal with those regulations? And it sounds like it's going to the legislature and going, hey, we got to change this. Yes. Yeah, so there's actually three parts to changing those regulations. Uh, one is the commissioner himself has direction on the policies within the department so it's not law it's just how do we implement it and uh, give you an example in one case uh, the uh, the hemp uh, application which if you want to produce hemp you've got to apply for it uh, for a permit and there's only a one month period of time for the application uh, during the year and if you miss that window in the November to December time frame for the coming year then you've got to wait a whole nother year to apply again because they're just not going to accept applications year round. Well, why is that? Why shouldn't we just accept applications in March for somebody that all of a sudden decided, you know what, I think this is something I want to do. Let's enable those farmers instead of hinder them. So some of those things that are internal policies, I'm going to look through all of those types of things and how can we support the farmers rather than make a bureaucracy and just tell you no. Uh, then the next level is uh, is state and federal laws. So some of these are federal laws. Uh, uh, meat processing is a good example. I highly support Thomas Massey's Prime Act. Uh, Thomas Massey is a congressman from Kentucky, probably the most uh, conservative congressman uh, in all of the U.S. Congress. And by the way, he's endorsed me. Uh, he's a big food freedom guy. And the Prime Act would allow... Uh, uh, custom slaughtered meat to be sold by the retail cut if it's within your own state. What, and what does that mean in practicality? Uh, so so we have three levels of, of uh, meat processing, uh, USDA and state, which most people are familiar with, and then custom slaughter is where you own the animal, take it to the slaughterhouse, have it pr uh, processed, and then you get that meat back and it's marked as not for sale. And you can't sell those individual packages of meat. Well, that's inherently safe for you to take home and eat yourself. And we have no statistics at all to show that that's ever harmed anybody. I mean, literally none. And yet, we're not allowed to sell those by the individual cut. Well, the Prime Act would allow people to sell those. So as a farmer, I could take a cow or a hog in and have slaughtered by custom slaughter. And now I can sell those individual cuts. That means that people are going to be able to get uh, local processed meat, local grown meat uh, from a farmer they know nearby, and they don't have to buy a whole cow or a whole hog or split it with somebody. They can just say, you know what, I want a couple of steaks or I want five pounds of hamburger or, you know, whatever is individual that, is cuts. Is that a federal law or a state law? That is a, the Prime Act is a federal law. And by the way, uh, our very own uh, Delegate Hornby had submitted a state version of that same bill, uh, which I highly support. And, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to see that through as well. So to the state and federal level, we need to pass that uh, that would allow the custom slaughtered meat. What that's going to do is it's going to it's going to inspire custom slaughter processors to open back up where some of them have closed down. They're going to say, hey, there's an opportunity for me. 
You're going to have farmers that are going to decide to grow their herds again and produce more meat to sell in the local community because instead of trying to sell $3,000 worth of meat at one go, uh, you can you can slaughter this animal and keep it in a freezer and sell individual packages either at a farmer's market or directly from your farm or however you uh, market your products so, so locally. I've got a question on this then because I was uh, in, in, in Deep Creek, uh, Maryland, Western Maryland, mm -hmm. um, summer vacation a couple of years ago we went to a farmer's market and there was a a farmer there who was selling uh basically new york strip steaks uh right there at the farmer's market which i bought individual cuts mm -hmm. that this guy said we slaughter on our own farm and we bring them here to the farmer's market to sell them was he in violation of the law or is there some exceptions to that law so i don't know exactly. by the way it was phenomenally good i gotta I, tell you we grilled it up and it was as good as anything i've ever had i believe it and i totally believe that that's his right to do so and you as a customer to engage i'm not sure what maryland's laws are uh, so i can't speak to that i know that would be illegal in west virginia really absolutely and, you know, we have on-farm processing for poultry and rabbits. Why do we not have on-farm processing for beef, uh, pork, lamb, et cetera? And so I'm a huge supporter of that, uh, and that's another thing that I'm going to uh, find a sponsor for. So as the commissioner, you have influence on these laws. Uh, there's quite often uh, the commissioners will say, we need a regulation to do, you know, fill in the blank, and they take a, a proposed bill to a – uh, you know, one of their delegate or senator buddies and get a, you know, get a lead sponsor on it because ultimately it's the delegates and senators who have to propose those bills. But mm -hmm. but it gets uh, uh, brought into them from bureaucrats in many cases. And so I'm going to take bills to them that cuts the regulations and opens up more opportunity for small farmers in West Virginia to to be able to do these kinds of things that we're talking about. As you've had conversation with our legislators, uh, how confident are you in being able to get these things done quickly? Because I'm just thinking as I, again, look at your hat and, and our beginning conversation, it took 12 years to get that raw milk bill through everything. Uh, I'm sure you're not wanting to wait 12 years. It's time to get rid of these, uh, these uh, onerous regulations now. Correct. Yeah, so it's taken 12 years because of a few things. One is uh, the commissioners of agriculture in the past didn't support cutting the regulation on it. And so they used their influence to keep the law the way it was, which was a prohibition against selling raw milk. And, uh, and so I'm going to use that influence to say this is not inherently a bad product. We just need to follow these practices, and we can educate mm -hmm. people on it. And we need to protect folks' natural inherent rights to have access to that food. Uh, so, so I believe that just by me being in that position and taking a different, uh, a different viewpoint, uh, I think that's going to help. The other thing is we have uh, a lot of delegates who just listen to uh, those, you know, secretaries and commissioners and folks who are the the leaders in the various uh, uh, bureaucratic departments, and so, you know, they're listening to the experts, and I believe that I'm the expert on local farming and what is the real deal so i'm going to use that influence to cut those regulations and there are people out there obviously the raw milk bill passed because there's enough delegates and senators in there that do believe it so we've got them in there now and uh, i think there's a lot of freedom loving uh, legislators who are willing to go that route they just need the proper influence that this is the way we need to go and be assured that in fact, they're not making a mistake in that. About a minute left. Roy, go ahead and talk into your camera and tell our audience why you're the better selection for Ag Commissioner in West Virginia. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, my name is Roy Ramey. I'm running for Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of West Virginia. I am a small farmer. I'm a retired veteran. Uh, I started as a private and worked my way up to lieutenant colonel before retiring. Uh, I'm a homeschool advocate, uh, which is a freedom issue. And uh, I am going to cut the regulations to try to grow farming. We've lost way too many farms in West Virginia, and that is unsustainable. So I intend to change that course, uh, bring more opportunity, more economy, and more common sense to uh, the art of food and food freedom. I'm endorsed by uh, Joel Salatin from Polyface Farm, who's the most famous farmer in the world. And I'm also endorsed by Congressman Thomas Massey, uh, who is uh, a food freedom congressman and several other folks, and I'm very proud of that, and I can do a better job than the course that we've had now for the last two uh, two sessions. So, Roy, thanks for dropping by. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate it.